So there's some very interesting developments. There have been a lot of rumors about expansion, no expansion. There's also been some, you know, hopes, for example, Venezuela joining. Now there's reports that uh, it's not necessarily on the list for the next round of membership expansion. We know that there's dozens and dozens and dozens, 30 plus countries that want to join. What have you been hearing about the upcoming BRICS summit and, and what we might expect? Yeah, well, you know, before all of these summits, are, there are always so many excited rumors about they're going to launch the new BRICS currency and all of this. It's hard to know what's actually going on because these countries, understandably, are trying to keep things pretty quiet. Um, given how much they're being targeted by the West. What, what I do expect to see is a more deepening economic integration, um, especially, you know, I've, I know some people who work at the New Development Bank, which is the BRICS Bank, and there's a lot of discussion of trying to de-dollarize their loans. That's a big issue. I, unfortunately, in the short term, I don't think we're going to see the, the highly vaunted BRICS currency yet. I think this is a, a medium to long-term project. There are a lot of complications I mean, uh, especially given how the economic infrastructure that has been used for decades is just so deeply embedded in international trade and investment that it's difficult in just a few years to replace that. I do think, again, in the medium to long term, it will be replaced. But again, these things don't happen in a year or two. But what we are seeing is more and more economic integration, especially through the use of local currencies. And this is something that the New Development Bank has prioritized the current President of the New Development Bank is Dilma Rousseff, who is the leftist former president of Brazil from the Workers' Party. She has been close with the Chinese. In fact, President Xi Jinping just gave her a top award congratulating her. And um, one of the things that she's really trying to do with some of her economists is de-dollarize the loans that they've been giving to developing countries, more and more of which are trying to join the New Development Bank as an alternative to the World Bank. Because, of course, the World Bank, which is dominated by the U.S., demands many conditionalities on countries, whereas the NDB, the BRICS Bank, does not. So that's one of the main priorities. We see a lot of BRICS countries de-dollarizing their, inter their bilateral trade. So Russia and China now, they do more than 90% of their bilateral trade in their local currencies. And in fact, it, this was quietly admitted by the IMF, China now settles more than half of its own bilateral trade in yuan, not in U.S. dollars. That number has increased very significantly. So I think in the short term, what's going to happen is more and more BRICS countries and more and more countries in the global south in general that are not even part of BRICS yet, they're going to de-dollarize their trade through using local currencies or using other currencies, maybe if they have a, a very... Um, they have a very small economy and they have a, a currency that's very difficult to get access to abroad. They might use something like the yuan, something like Indian rupee, Russian ruble, or another currency. So I think that's something that BRICS is really prioritizing at the moment, creating the infrastructure needed to do that. Both China and Russia have developed alternatives to the SWIFT system, the interbank messaging system dominated by the United States. And they are preparing that infrastructure to be used when necessary. Russia has already been experimenting with it. China has not yet, but it's in place for the, the possibility. They understand that the U.S. may try to do what China to China, what it has done to Russia, disconnecting Chinese banks from SWIFT, applying very heavy sanctions. So this infrastructure is being built out. It's much more complicated than many people think it is. It's not as easy as just saying that we're just going to do it overnight. But these are obviously the discussions that are going to be happening and also simply deepening trade in general, not regardless of what the currencies are. So having more and more investment that cuts out the West. And this is what the West really doesn't understand. They're so stuck. We were talking about this colonial arrogance. They really still believe that they're the most powerful countries on Earth. But the BRICS economy is now taken together when you measure their GDP at purchasing power parity. It's larger than the G7, the seven imperialist countries that colonize the world. And over time, the BRICS countries have a larger and larger share of global GDP, whereas the G7 countries have a, sh a smaller and smaller share of world GDP. We see that China grows at a very healthy pace, despite all the ridiculous Western propaganda about it. India is growing quite, quite well. And many other countries interested in joining BRICS, like Indonesia, Vietnam, uh, uh, maybe potentially we'll see 
who else, but, you know, uh, uh, the point is, is that, as you mentioned, over 30 countries have expressed interest in joining BRICS. So as they join, it's going to be all of the fast growing economies around the world that are also growing their real economy, unlike the Western financialized yes. economies, which have been deindustrialized. So even if you look at GDP, it's actually not the best measurement, despite the fact that you know, BRICS is now larger in terms of GDP purchasing power parity. But if you look, for instance, at share of global manufacturing, if you look at share of oil and gas production, if you look at share of global food production, if you look at many other commodities, iron ore, uh, lithium, these are things that are needed for uh, global manufacturing. BRICS is even more powerful than the G7, which again has been relatively deindustrialized. So yes, a lot of uh, f finance is concentrated, financial power is concentrated in Wall Street in the city of London. But we see that, as we see in the war in Ukraine, okay, fine, you have all of this financial wealth, but if you can't actually develop the manufacturing capabilities that you need to maintain advanced technologies or to win a war, it doesn't matter how big your GDP is. We were told by all of these neoliberal economists in the West that Russia's economy was so weak because they were using nominal GDP at, the, at, at a very unfavorable exchange rate for the Russian ruble to the dollar, not looking at Russian GDP PPP, which is actually quite high. It's one of the biggest economies on earth. But even regardless of that, regardless of GDP as a metric, if you look at Russia's manufacturing capabilities, its industrial base, we were told that Russia is so weak, but now Russia is actually growing very, very quickly. And Russia has shown that in terms of its military capabilities, its military industry is actually very strong and getting stronger. So Western, again, we were talking about this with Israel, the danger of believing your own propaganda. We see this with Western policymakers, the danger of believing your own neoliberal economic propaganda, telling you that our economies are so big and strong and great. But a huge part of that is the big bubble of the financial sector. You can't eat debt. You can't eat loans. And you can't certainly develop these advanced technologies when the entire supply chain is located in the BRICS countries. Yes, indeed. Very well said, Ben. And, you know, everything you said about the state of the U.S. economy and the state of uh, really the whole collective West in terms of their economic power. Uh, it's interesting that BRICS for so long has been virtually ignored uh, or minimized in terms of its overall impact and importance. Now we see that still continue to an effect, but it's interesting that one of the biggest reports I've seen in response to BRICS come out of uh, this U.S. foreign policy blob uh, through Human Rights Watch is it reflects exactly what you said. Uh, uh, the United States is right now through its uh, through its uh, revolving door at the Human Rights Watch is talking about um, giving human rights, right? Human rights. It's not it's not about, man, we, maybe we should actually start competing economically. Maybe we should be, uh, you know, figuring out how to do our own kind of model. And we know that the U.S. has tried at least on the surface and aesthetically to, you know, the Build Back Better Coalition and all this, all these uh, various uh, initiatives to compete with BRICS or China's Belt and Road Initiative or what have you. But, you know, they just, they're just advertisements that just come and go and nothing ever comes out of them. So it's just so interesting that one of the most impactful policy reports leading up to the BRICS summit coming out of the U.S. is talking about, you know, we need to focus more on human rights, right? Like human rights needs to be, what do you BRICS? I mean, BRICS, of course, the BRICS countries, most men, you know, all of them are concerned about their own versions and definitions of human rights. But we know that BRICS isn't coming together based on human rights. They're coming together to economically integrate, as you said, to prosper. To yeah, to develop, to prosper together, to figure out how to do that in a very, uh, a very unstable world in large part because of the U.S. so-called rules-based order. But any any final thoughts? Yeah, well, this is something that's so misunderstood about BRICS because critics of BRICS say, you know, Western critics, they say, look at the internal contradictions between China and India, which have border conflicts and the Indian government's constantly criticizing China, blah, blah, blah. 
or they say, look, you know, uh, now you have Iran and Saudi Arabia, although Saudi Arabia hasn't officially accepted the offer. But the point is you have these internal political disputes, but they don't understand that BRICS is fundamentally not first and foremost a political organization. It's an economic one. It consists of largely developing and emerging economies that want to create alternative economic infrastructure so they can provide more opportunities for themselves so they're no longer completely uh, choked by the U.S. dominated financial system. The global financial system was created in a way after World War II that gave the U.S. this monopoly power with the reserve currency, veto power of the, over the IMF and the World Bank. We see that the WTO has been completely just paralyzed largely by the U.S., ironically. So BRICS is an opportunity for these developing economies, emerging markets to get together and create new opportunities for trade, development, investment, infrastructure. And this is exactly what's happening. So yes, China and India have these disputes, but they're also working together in terms of economic development. These are countries that have similar histories with colonialism, with poverty, with underdevelopment. They want to lift their population out of poverty and become prosperous countries. This is true for every country that's interested in joining BRICS. And in order to do so, they need to create more space and more alternatives so they're not only reliant on a financial system that was created by the U.S. to benefit the U.S. at the expense of everyone else, period. This is why people are confused why a country like India, which has a government that is very right wing and tends to lean toward the West, is still interested in these alternatives because it's in their own economic interest. And they, But the U.S. expects every ally to subordinate their own economic interest to those of the U.S., like Europe is doing. The U.S. expects countries to commit economic suicide on behalf of Wall Street, because if it's good for Wall Street, they say it's good for the world. But we see some countries that even if they lean politically toward the West, economically, it's in their benefit to seek alternatives, like Saudi Arabia, for instance, or the United Arab Emirates, which is part of the New Development Bank. These are countries that historically have been very close to the U.S., basically client regimes for decades. But now their largest trading partner is China. And increasingly, they see that China is the world's largest economy with, with GDP measured at purchase power parity. And in the years that come, it's going to keep growing significantly faster than the U.S. China is here to stay. It's a massive country with 1.4 billion people. India is a massive country with 1.4 billion people growing rapidly. They can see that it's in their economic interest to look east, not simply to the west. And the U.S., it, it, its peak was already met. It was already reached decades ago. And its influence is declining, not increasing. But the U.S. expects these countries to simply go along with what it wants, despite the fact that it has nothing to offer them. Like you said, it, it has human rights, which human means rights. nothing. It doesn't <laughs> which is have usually the opposite of human rights, too. <laughs> yeah. It, it doesn't even have, the, at, at this point, the biggest market that it used to have. Historically, the U.S. had this massive market, but China and India now are huge growing markets. So yes. it comes down to this, this famous quote that's been attributed to many different African leaders. We don't know exactly who said it, but we've heard similar things from African officials saying every time a Western politician visits or every time a Chinese uh, politician visits Africa, different, you know, maybe some people say this was in Kenya. So every time, uh, allegedly it was the former president of Kenya, every time China visits Kenya, we get a hospital, we get a school, we get a bridge. Every time a Western politician visits Kenya, we get a lecture. You can't eat a lecture. You can't develop your country based on a lecture. And a lot of these countries are tired of the lectures. They're going to go along with the countries that can pr help provide them with trade, with investment, with infrastructure development and with poverty reduction. So we, we've both been talking about Human Rights Watch for a while as being an NGO that's very much uh, connected to the U.S. foreign policy establishment. But here is their report upcoming um, as we uh, head toward the upcoming BRICS summit in Kazan in Russia. They have a whole policy paper about what the U.S. should do about BRICS, what their policy should be. I'm just going to scroll down to their recommendations, which is very much at the end here. And I just want you to look at these real quick, Ben. Um, it's not it's we don't have to uh, 
go too deep. But in terms of recommendations, this is what the U.S. should do. Form an interagency unit like, uh, on BRICS. So State Department, USAID, Department of Commerce, Treasury, etc., National Security Council should all come together right, and, and talk about what they need to do about BRICS. Then form a strategy document that recognizes BRICS as an entity which the U.S. government should have a human rights grounded policy and outline priority areas for implementing that policy. Revamp the U.S. approach to economic, social, and cultural rights, meaning that they need to compete with BRICS on issues that the United States definitely doesn't know how to do. And then here's the big one, supporting civil society engagement in multilateral spaces. Uh, we all know what civil society means when it comes to the U.S. empire. But Ben, in my estimation, Human Rights Watch seems to be advocating for more engagement with BRICS. But to me, engagement means war, <laughs> you know, war by other means. All of this seems to me to be, uh, we, we know what's happening in the Middle East and West Asia. We know things are very much heating up. But on all these other fronts, it appears that the U.S. empire is becoming more desperate and that whether we're looking at the Russia front or the China front or now as we approach the BRICS summit, the BRICS and multipolar front, uh, the United States is really just absolutely scrambling on uh, exactly what they should do about it. And it, of course, all of it points to uh, more war and more war. Well, on this point of the weaponization of human rights, this is nothing new. We've seen this for many decades. The U.S. government and organizations that are closely linked to the U.S. government, like Human Rights Watch, which has a revolving door with the State Department, they have always used human rights as a weapon against their adversaries to try to destabilize foreign countries, claiming that they supposedly violate human rights, while the U.S., has more people in prison than any other country, it has you know about less than 5% of the world population and about 25% of the world's prisoners. U.S. police kill over 1,000 people every single year, especially Black Americans and Latinos. The U.S. has a massive homelessness crisis that's getting worse and worse by the year. The U.S. has surprisingly high rates of poverty and child malnutrition. The U.S. has extreme inequality and racism and it is parts of, especially, you know, like the South where we don't even have functioning sewage systems. I mean, there have been many reports about uh, even, you know, UN experts looking at the horrific U uh, U.S. human rights violations that are systematic that, that, that other countries could talk about, but they don't try to interfere in the U.S. to justify invading the U.S., unlike the U.S. does to other countries. But um, on this point of human rights being used as a weapon, I'm reminded of a famous speech that was given by Colin Powell, who was the Secretary of State in the Bush administration, uh, a U.S. general who oversaw the horrific uh, shock and awe bombing of Iraq. And uh, Colin Powell gave a press conference in 2001 after 9-11, and he famously said that human rights organizations are what he called force multipliers for the U.S. military. And he said that they are part of our combat team. That's a quote. Look this up. He said, human rights NGOs, so-called non-governmental organizations, are part of the U.S. military's combat team and a force multiplier in the beginning of the so-called war on terror after 9-11. This was, of course, in the lead up to the invasion of Iraq and many of the other wars. According to scholars at Brown University, yeah, I wrote about this a few years ago. Um, according to scholars at Brown University, they found that that uh, millions, over 4 million people died in the U.S. post 9-11 wars and tens of millions of people were displaced. So, I mean, uh, yeah, here's the quote. This is this is the quote from a 2001 meeting with Colin Powell. He said, quote, I am serious about making sure we have the best relationship with the NGOs who are such a force multiplier for us, such an important part of our combat team. Incredible. So th this is this is what Human Rights Watch is for the U.S. military. They say it openly. So Human Rights Watch says we have to support human rights and we have to oppose China and Russia and BRICS. And then the U.S. military says, look, Human Rights said this. Human Rights Watch said this. So now we need to attack China or whatever. We need to send more weapons to Ukraine to attack Russia. We need to send long, you know, long range missiles to shoot deep into Russian territory, hit Moscow. Um, 
Now, as for uh, the this larger propaganda war against BRICS, this is, of course, part of a hybrid war, right? It's not just the U.S. military. It's also the information war, the economic war through sanctions on Russia, tariffs on China. And, and the information war is a big part of it. The House of Representatives just passed a law, bipartisan law, with support from Republicans and Democrats that will allot $1.6 billion over five years to fund anti-China propaganda around the world. And if you read the law closely, it's not only to media outlets, but it's also to so-called civil society organizations. So what they're calling for is massively expanding the budget of what the National Endowment for Democracy does, the NED, which is a CIA cutout, which was created under the Reagan administration to do what the CIA had historically done covertly, but to do it more overtly to fund propaganda media outlets, to fund political groups and so-called NGOs in foreign countries to try to destabilize foreign governments. That was done through the NED and it was also done through the USAID, US Agency for International Development. Well, now the House has passed this law to give $1.6 billion over five years to what institutions? USAID that is going to oversee this and the State Department. So we know we now see that not, not only is there going to be a massive increase in anti-China propaganda and disinformation around the world, but in anti-China so-called NGOs, which are not actually NGOs. They say that they're non-governmental, but they're funded by the US government. So they're actually semi-governmental organizations. They're outsourced US government organizations that are U.S. puppet organizations used to try to destabilize foreign governments and spread anti-China propaganda as part of this new Cold War. Now, finally, you mentioned the CIA. Honestly, this is hilarious because it's two things. Yes, it's a sign of desperation, but two, it's also part of the psychological war, right? Because the U.S. wants people in China and Russia and the DPRK and Iran, they want them to feel like the CIA has has people everywhere listening to what you're doing. We have our tentacles and everything. We're all powerful. Just like Israel wants all of the forces in West Asia, all of the resistance groups to feel to feel afraid that Israel is spying on everything that you're doing and it's all powerful and, and you're, you're so weak compared to them. So we shouldn't overstate their influence. So what the U.S. is, is trying to do is to try to scare people and, and these, this propaganda camp, or sorry, this um, recruitment campaign is specifically using Chinese language, Farsi, and Korean. So they're targeting yeah. China, Iran, and the DPRK. And we know that they've been doing the same thing in Russia. So they're trying to make people in China, authorities afraid that they have so the CIA has their hooks. But in reality, as you pointed out, I think it's also a sign of desperation because the US wants people to be afraid, but in reality, we know from reports that China has been very successful in uprooting these CIA spy networks, eliminating these traitors and spies that have been trying to undermine Chinese sovereignty. Russia has certainly done that. It's been very successful in uprooting the networks of CIA spies. And Iran and the DPRK have been doing the same. So, yeah, I mean, you can see this as a sign of desperation that the U.S., the CIA has so few traitors in China and Russia and Iran and the DPRK willing to betray their country on behalf of U.S. imperialism, that it has to go to Twitter and ask yeah. people in these countries to please send us information. Yeah, 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 that's exactly Twitter, Facebook, LinkedIn. I mean, these are the avenues where they're putting literally, I mean, U.S. government agencies are putting, you know, in their language instructions to help us undermine the regime of uh, Xi Jinping and help us uh, commit you know, treason. Uh, yeah, help us commit treason. And what's so funny about this too is that, especially in, in the case of China, um, the pool of people. I mean, plenty of Chinese people use X. Plenty of Chinese people use these. Like it's, but it's it's um, the kind uh, uh, the the reach of this kind of methodology will inevitably be very very limited because not only are you get are you seeking help from a limited pool of people already but also you're using avenues which already have even a smaller pool of chinese people using them um, as frequently as maybe 
you know, other countries that are very dependent, uh, you know, across Asia and other parts of the world. So it's it's very interesting because China does have this huge nexus of its own independent uh, applications and, and, and tech software and things like that, where, you know, people don't feel in the social media realm where, you know, they're relying on, let's say, Facebook to spend all of their time uh, uh, engaging in social media. They're more so using their Chinese uh, built uh, social media and apps uh, to do that, which the U.S. is obviously showing its hand that it has not infiltrated one bit and cannot infiltrate, as you said. Thank you for tuning in to my latest video. I appreciate all of your support. This channel, however, needs your help. I am seeking to make this channel more sustainable in the long term and upgrade necessary equipment to ensure that this work continues onward and makes progress to give you all of the geopolitical analysis that you all deserve. For that reason, I'm asking you to become a member of my Patreon community at patreon.com slash Danny Haifong. You can find that link in the video description or in the pinned comment below. For whatever amount you choose to give, just know you are supporting independent media that you can't find anywhere else. Thank you so much, and I look forward to the next video.